Love well, it. Okay. What's your second one you're uh, sharing with us today? Number two for me is all about diagnosis in coaching. Uh, mm -hmm. So within coaching, one of the biggest challenges for teachers or coaches, should I say, in addition to just like having in their brain a whole heap of uh, tools and tools and tips, Craig, uh, <laughs> to, kind of, to kind of draw upon uh, and these like the kind of uh, content you've just been sharing with us now. It's also a challenge to work out, well, what is it that th this particular teacher can or should work on based upon this small segment I've seen of their lesson? Mm. And this is something I learned from Josh Goodrich and an idea he's been developing for a while and then I've subsequently, and Peps McRae and I have been kind of working with Josh on it as well to flesh out a little bit more. But Josh's key insight was that we can think about the diagnosis of coaching the next kind of action step for teachers to work on to be based around Willingham's simple model of memory, uh, mm -hmm. which is absolutely fantastic. So, you know, within that model, things in the environment, students need to pay attention to it, moves into working memory. We've got to think about cognitive load. They think about it, moves up into long-term memory, hopefully gets stored and we reinforce it through retrieval. So the idea is that we can, you know, that's how learning happens and we can also use it as a kind of diagnostic flow chart. So the first question that a coach can ask when they're in a teacher's classroom is, are there any attention issues? So are all students kind of paying attention? Uh, like, are there any disruptions? And, you know, if we, we're kind of, currently we're reordering the step lab sequence um, for the Australian version at least under this. So in intention, we've got things like, you know, entry routine, are students attending to their learning as soon as they come in? Active listening routine, are you able to get their attention back straight away? And then addressing student disruptions. If the attention's pretty good, tick, we can move on to thinking about cognitive load. So, you know, is a teacher building upon pre-existing knowledge? Are there explanations kind of clear and, and memorable? And have they provided scaffolds and models so that students' cognitive load um, isn't being overwhelmed or students' cognitive resources aren't being overwhelmed? Once you've got that, we can think about thought, which is when we're starting to move information from, you know, process it in working memory and move it up into long-term memory. So we can think about, you know, questioning. Is questioning driver th driving thought? Is there the rigor there, the kind of content you're relating to? Uh, and then independent practice. What's actually happening in an independent practice? Are students thinking about the core content? From there, into feedback, things like culture of error, error, whole class response and reteaching, and then we can kind of move on to thinking about consolidation and relating to tre retrieval practice. So for me, this was just a super useful mental model that already fit uh, really, really well with the way I think about learning in general. Uh, and I thought it was really helpful for teachers and coaches to know about it uh, in terms of diagnosing next steps for teachers to work on. That's good. Give, give us those five steps. Was it five steps? Just give us those again, all just so we can get, get those all together. Yeah, well, I mean, this actually, so I started with attention, but actually the first thing that's worth starting with is curriculum, which is what I started talking about oh, as my yes. first takeaway today. And that's because like, if we think about the Oliver Kivaglioli image with kind of the environment, student pays attention to something in the environment. The first thing for us to make sure is that the content in the environment is actually worth paying attention to. Um, so I'd probably put like curriculum first. And that was an insight we had, had on, a, on the plane to Perth with Peps and, Peps and Josh, uh, then attention, cognitive load, thought, feedback, consolidation. Love it, right, okay. Now, I could talk to you all day about this all because this is what I'm obsessed with at the moment, right? And I'll, t I'll tell you, you're, you're partly to blame for this. So I mentioned at the start, one of my um, things at the moment is I'm in schools lots. And um, I do one of two different things in schools. So model one is I'll spend the morning watching lessons and this tends to be what I do the first day of support in a school. Spend the morning watching lessons, 10 minutes here, five minutes there, dipping in, dipping back out, and so on and so forth. And I'll look for a trend. I'll look for something as a department that feels like something we can all work on together. And then in the afternoon, I'll do some bespoke CPD on that with all the, uh, excuse me, <coughs> with, with all the department together, and that'll be fine. But then once we move into kind of day two, three, and four of support, it tends to move into a more individual coaching model because then staff have got different things they want to be working on and, and so on and so forth. So I'm absolutely obsessed with coaching. And my two favorite things that I've kind of read or listened to on coaching is first, your interview with Josh, I thought was phenomenal. I tweeted it out at the time. I thought it was brilliant. The double, the, the, the idea of doing the double bill 
with the kind of theory and then what listening to him coach you, I thought was superb. And I'll put links down the show and I thought it was amazing. But then also, and again, he's going to come up in one of my later tips. Um, Adam Boxer writes really well on, on coaching. And I had him on the my Mr. Bart Maths podcast, the episode before last on how to observe a lesson. And we talked for two hours about how he observes lessons. And I think what I try and do now is a kind of a bit of a hybrid of, of the two approaches. Um, so I'm going to ask you a tricky question in a moment, Al, but I'll just, just do a reflection first. Um, so when I go into a lesson, I use what Adam calls this hypothesis model. So I'll spend the first few minutes just getting a bit of a sense of what's going on. I'll take a few pictures. I normally take a picture of what's on the teacher's board, grab a book, take a picture of where the kids are at, just so I've got a bit of a frame of reference. And I'll just take a step back and just get a sense of, of what's going on. And then I'll form a hypothesis, a hypothesis about something that might not be going right in the lesson. So maybe the teachers started doing an explanation, but as I look around, I can see all the kids aren't paying full attention. Some are trying to write things down and so on. Or the teachers ask the question to check for understanding, but they've only heard from one child. And I just wonder whether that child at the back really knew that and blah, blah, blah. So I form a hypothesis. And then for the next five or 10 minutes, I'll test that hypothesis. So I'll gather critical evidence. So I'll speak to a child or I'll do some counting round, get some actual physical evidence that then I can take back and we can use in our kind of coaching session going forward. And it's really interesting. Whenever you and Josh were talking, you talked about the trickiest part of the um, kind of coaching conversation. I think it's what you called the bid wherever, you know, everything's going well up to that point. And then the coach says, right, here's the thing I think we should work on. And it can be potentially quite awkward and so on. But if you have that critical evidence, and I think the, the way Josh did it with you is he'd, um, he'd listen to some of the things that you were saying to the kids in terms of feedback you were giving while you were going round and stuff. And I'll do it. I'll say it's almost like a bit of a reveal. So I, I did one with a guy recently. This was one of my favorite ones. Um, and I said, right, you were doing a brilliant explanation of the volume of a cone. And he was at the board and he was relating the volume of a cone to the volume of a cylinder. And it was brilliant. So I took a picture of his explanation. And I said, whilst you were doing that, what do you reckon your kids were doing? And he said, well, they were, they were listening to me. They were, they were listening to my explanation. I said, right, I'm just going to show you some pictures of what your kids are actually doing. And I showed him some pictures. And about 30 to 40% of the kids were had the head down writing because they were trying to write what he was doing on the board. But the key point there was, we know it's very difficult to write and listen at the same time. Also, he's at the board gesturing things and the kids are missing it because they've got the head down and so on and so forth. So that critical evidence was the key for me in terms of that, that kind of coaching conversation that then gets them on board. I find And I think whenever you were chatting to Josh, because again, you were uh, difficult's the wrong word, but it got a bit kind of fiery at one point, right? It's the right, it's the right <laughs> word, Craig. <laughs> but then whenever he had that evidence and he was able to read back to you the things that you said, you could almost feel it that you were then kind of coming on board and so on. And I always find that. So I think that critical evidence is key. But to loop this back to what you were saying with the, the kind of almost hierarchy of things to look out for, I would say nine times out of 10, it stops at attention for me. It's always attention because again, like you've said, they alluded to there. If you don't have the kids attention, everything else is a waste of time. I'd almost go so far as to say curriculum's a bit of a waste of time, right? If the kids aren't attending to it, forget it. And it's, but it's, it's very rarely what the teacher thinks they need to be working on. Like when I have these conversations with heads of the department, it's okay. Is there enough challenge in our curriculum? Well, let's worry about that in a minute. Let's check your kids are all paying attention. Let's check your teacher is getting data and evidence from your kids that they're understanding, you know, what they're saying. Then we can worry about um, curriculum. Then we can worry about independent practice, building resilience and all that kind of thing. So for me, it, the vast majority of the time, it, it always stops at attention. Um, I've got one question to ask you all, but I just wanted to pause on in case there was anything you wanted to come back on um, about that. I think I, I couldn't agree more. I think Josh calls it the, the pivotal piece of evidence. Yeah. It's the, it's the bit of evidence on which the bid kind of really hinges. Uh, so yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's my, here's my question. And I'm going to ask this to peps actually, cause I'm talking to him again next week, but I just wanted to get your take very, very quickly. I'll tell you the bit of the instructional coach model that I can't do, right. That I find bloody awkward. Right. And that is the rehearsal. Oh my God. Right. So I love the, 
praise at the start. I love the bid, the thing you call the bid, the kind of critical efforts. I love that. I, what I also love is the kind of implementation planning where we sit down and say, okay, when's the first time we can make this change? Let's plan it all out together. Looking great at that point. The rehearsal bit, like especially if it's something like cold call and they have to then like, like oh, either we go into an empty classroom and we're practicing questions or they're doing it to me. I just find it bloody awkward, Ollie. So how do you get this rehearsal bit right? And do I need to do it? Can I not cut this bit out? Oh, mate, you should, have, you should have come to the training we ran on uh, 6th of March here. We had Josh and Peps down and we had 150 teachers standing up in a big hall rehearsing stuff for about two hours. Wow, It was amazing. Okay. It was okay. so good. Um, I think Josh is coming out in October again, so you should fly over, Craig, and we'll, <laughs> we'll do a session. But, well, I'm going to answer your questions in reverse order. Do you okay. need to do it? 100% you need to do it. Interesting, uh, okay. Because, you know, t teaching is a performance profession and – the fact of the matter is, you know, Sam Sims and, and colleagues have a fantastic paper on this. It doesn't take long for teachers to form habits, right? And if you're working with even a first year teacher, if they're in term two, term three, they probably form some pretty consistent habits around the way they ask questions, where they're looking in the classroom, all these kinds of things. And if we want to actually sustainably change teacher practice, what we need to do, we need to break old habits and form new ones. And the way to do that is through deliberate practice. A great example of this is I was working with a teacher yesterday on cold calling, uh, conveniently, given, given what you just mentioned there. <laughs> and he, he found, and I was, I was talking about norms of participation and one of the success criteria I added um, to the cold calling uh, step for, that we were working on from the pr prior coaching cycle was uh, make it really clear how you want students to respond. And this is because he was in the habit of ask, starting his questions with, who can tell me? Mm, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's he's a he's a third or fourth year teacher, and the the number of times he has said "Who can tell me?" in his career would be just in the thousands, yes, right? Yes. And so we we scripted exactly what he was going to say instead of "Who can tell me?" Yeah. Which was, you know, the question is right, and then. And I was like, okay, next, you, you know, you're going to teach the lesson later on today. Can you, let's pull up the slideshow you're going to be using. Go, let's, let's do it. And, you know, first thing that comes out of his mouth, actually he did it right a couple of times. <laughs> and then third time it's like, who can tell me? Yeah. And he's like, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> and so that's fine. You know, we just, we just need to do it and do it over and over and over yes. again because replacing that habit is absolutely crucial. Um, how can you, how can you get over it? Honestly, I, I, I think it's, it's actually fun. You, it might just be it, like... You must find it a bit awkward at times, do you, or not? No, it's just... I don't know. It's just fun. Like, it's... You have to kind of... It's like anything. If you're, you know, if you're at a... If you're at a party, right, and you want everyone to play a game, uh, you can't just be like, oh, everyone, yeah. we can play a game now, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it might be fun if we played a game. You've got to be <laughs> like, oh, guys... We have this amazing opportunity right now to play this game. I, mean, I, I heard about this game the, other, game the other day. I heard on a podcast. I did actually hear, hear about this game the other day. It's called Poetry for Neanderthals. Yeah, there's like a – you have to like explain words using monosyllabic words, like explain a concept using monosyllabic words, and if you break the rules, you get hit on the head with a club. So, you know, <laughs> guys, this fantastic game. We're all going to laugh our heads off. It's going to be great. We've got to explain these words. We've got to make poetry. Um, you get hit in the head with a club. Who wants to give it a go, right? If, if I do it like that, it gets people on board. And that's that's basically how I frame rehearsal. Um, I just say, all right, now we get to rehearse. Now we get to practice it to really make this make this concrete, you know? Now we get to build the habits that are going to really serve you well in the classroom. And I think doing it like that is absolutely crucial. I think another thing is about breaking the kind of potential power imbalance where it's like, mm. oh, I'm going to like – I'm going to get you, make you practice now and I'm going to tell you if your practice is okay. But there's also the issue with like, um, oh, you know, us as teachers are practicing. Why, do, why don't other people have to practice? So what I actually do in my first coaching session with people, uh, I have a video of myself coaching my boss, who's the director of teaching and learning at our school. And he's practicing his entry routine. And we're having a bit of fun with it. Yeah. But also I am also giving him feedback. And so in the first coaching session that I have with anyone, I will say, all right, Within coaching, we're going to do this thing called rehearsal. And I talk about habits and teaching and blah, blah, blah. And I say, here's a video of me, me coaching Mark. Uh, and this is what the rehearsal is going to look like. And they watch it. And I, and I say, Does it, is that something you think would help you improve your teaching as well? And every time they say yes. 
right? And so they've seen they've seen a leader within the school do it. They've seen that it can be a bit of fun. They've they've actually committed and bought into it, and that provides me with a springboard that in that first coaching session I can say, all right, now it's an opportunity for us to practice. Right. Okay. You've you've sold me. I'm going to try. I'm going to I'm going to yeah. Cause it's been on the back burner this rehearsal bit, so it's back to the forefront. Okay. I'll, I'll report back next month. I'll report back to see whether. Oh, yeah. mate. How that's gone. Can't hit. Can't wait to hear about it. <laughs> All right.